In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. It is when we trust that we can fully realize the healing that God offers. For the times in which we fail to put our trust in our God, we pause and ask him for his mercy and forgiveness. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all of the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who govern all things both in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the pleading of your people and bestow your peace on our times. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the first book of Samuel. David spoke to Saul, Let your majesty not lose courage. I am at your service to go fight the Philistine. But Saul answered David, You cannot go against this Philistine and fight with him, for you are only a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. David continued, The Lord, who delivered me from the claws of the lion and the bear, will also keep me safe from the clutches of this Philistine. Saul answered David, Go, the Lord will be with you. Then, staff in hand, David selected five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in the pocket of his shepherd's bag. With his sling also ready to hand, He approached the Philistine. With his shield bearer marching before him, the Philistine also advanced closer and closer to David. When he had sized David up and seen that he was youthful and ruddy and handsome in appearance, the Philistine held David in contempt. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come against me with a staff? Then the Philistine cursed David by his gods and said to him, Come here to me, and I will leave your flesh for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David answered him, You come against me with sword and spear and scimitar, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel that you have insulted. Today the Lord shall deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will leave your corpse and the corpses of the Philistine army for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Thus the whole land shall learn that Israel has a God. All this multitude, too, shall learn that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he shall deliver you into our hands. The Philistine then moved to meet David at close quarters, while David quickly ran toward the battle line in the direction of the Philistine. David put his hand into the bag and took out a stone, hurled it with the sling, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone embedded itself in his brow, and he fell prostrate on the ground. Thus David overcame the Philistine 
with sling and stone. He struck the Philistine mortally and did it without a sword. Then David ran and stood over him. With the Philistine's own sword, which he drew from its sheath, he dispatched him and cut off his head. The word of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord, my rock. Blessed be the Lord, my rock. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for battle, my fingers for war. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, my refuge and my fortress, my stronghold, my deliverer, my shield in whom I trust, who subdues my people under me. Blessed be the Lord, my rock. O oh God, I will sing a new song to you. With a ten-stringed lyre, I will chant your praise. You who give victory to kings and deliver David, your servant from the evil sword. Blessed be the Lord, my rock. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus entered the synagogue. There was a man there who had a withered hand. They watched Jesus closely to see if he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, Come up here before us. Then he said to the Pharisees, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath rather than to do evil, to save life rather than to destroy it? But they remained silent. Looking around at them with anger and grieved at their hardness of heart, Jesus said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately took counsel with the Herodians against him to put him to death. The Gospel of the Lord. You know, Father Paul and I were contemporaries in the seminary, and we had some rather yahoos who were our scripture professors. Uh, they would often say things that kind of drove probably both of us up a tree at the same time. Uh, one of the professors, he would always criticize what's called the red letter Bibles, for example. You've seen those before, right? It's got black text and red text, and every time Jesus speaks, uh, they actually take it and highlight it in red. Well, his criticism of that was, you never really know if that was exactly what Jesus said, so do you really want to put that in there as if it's 100% gospel truth? And we could argue all day about inspiration of scripture and, and what authorship looked like. But the other thing that he said that I actually agreed with, which is probably one of the few times I ever agreed with him about anything, is that when you open up the sacred scripture and you start to read a passage, there's usually a little title that's inserted before that passage so that you know what's coming up. But oftentimes when you read those titles, they don't always tell you exactly what the meat and potatoes is of that particular scripture passage. I'll use a very familiar one, the prodigal son. Now, when you see that, you know what the story is about to be about, but does that really get its hands around what the story is all about? You first have to define prodigality. Now, what is it to be prodigal? It means to be wasteful. And sure, the son was wasteful, right? He goes and he spends it all in a life of dissipation, as the scripture says, very diplomatic of the scripture. But the person that's really the most prodigal is not the son at all, because parables aren't really about 
us and people who are parables about God. And what is the prodigal in the scripture? It's not the son, it's the father. He's the wasteful one, giving up all of his time, his resources for that son of his who goes and does all of those difficult things. I thought about our old scripture professor when I read today's gospel, because when you open up the Bible and you look at it, most of them will give it a particular title. It's called The Man with the Withered Hand. Now, of course, you know what we're about to talk about when you see that particular title, but does that really tell us the fullness of what today's scripture passage is all about? I'd like to take my editing tools sometimes and go in the Bible and scratch some of those out and and change it into something different. And if I had to give a new title to this one, it would be the Pharisees with the withered heart, because that's really what the scripture is all about. Not necessarily this man that seeks healing, but you see sometimes demonstrated human capacity and its terrible nature sometimes, even in the midst of the scripture. Now, as I read this a little bit more, it told me that there is really a description of the church today contained in this very parable that we heard, or this very passage from the sacred scripture. Because there are three different groups that you see gathered in church, in the synagogue, in this particular scripture. First, there are the ones that want to do healing. Well, the obvious one is Jesus himself, right? He goes into the synagogue, he knows exactly what Jewish law and custom is all about, and he sees a man who's afflicted. And what does he do? He weighs what the obvious is, and he makes a very calculated decision. Even though it is the Sabbath, even though it's outlawed that you do any type of work, this person is truly in need of healing. And what does he do? He heals them. Every single time we come in our churches, whether it be on a weekday or on a Sunday, there are people who are healers. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about yourself in that way, but that's really our commission that comes with the gospel, to go out there and bring the good news. And remember what Christ said in the scripture, if you have that faith, you will do things even greater than the ones that you see. Well, do you have that faith? That if you go out there and follow your gospel commission, do what you're called to do, that you're going to do the greatest things that you never even imagined. Be an instrument, a hand of God, especially in a broken world. Bring healing. So in the church, in the synagogue, there is always that one group of people, the ones that want to heal. Secondly, in the scripture, you see the second group of people, not the ones that want to heal, but the ones that need healing. Well, boy, that's an apt description too, right? Because oftentimes we drag ourselves in here saying, oh, Lord, I need some healing in my life. And we go through the laundry list of everything that we need. Uh, We oftentimes seek that from God, but the question becomes that question of trust again. Do we believe fully that God will give us not what we want, but what we truly need at a given time? And if we ask, it'll be given to us a hundredfold, as the scripture promises, as we know that God is faithful to us. This man with the withered hand apparently comes in with the same question. He's got this particular infirmity, which would limit what he can do. It would also make him, in some sense, an unclean person. So what does he want? Healing. And he's got every legitimate reason to seek it, to ask it, But the only problem is that it happens on the Sabbath day, the day where it's illegal for him to be actually healed. But then there's a tertiary group of people that you find in the church, not the ones that are healing and not the ones that need to be healed, but those who are always constantly the ones that are on your back and complaining about something, the ones that are the hostile group. Now, I try to not look for those Sunday at Mass, but there are people that are hostile, that will actually use the Scripture and the Word of God and twist it and pervert it in a way that really makes you sort of cringe a little bit. Now, think of what happens in the middle of the Scripture today. The Pharisees in Mark's Gospel have been on the scene now. Even though we're only in chapter 3, they've popped up over and over again. This is going to be the last episode before they disappear for a while. But they want to get Jesus so bad that what do they do at the end of the scripture after they confront him, after they tell him this is what the law is, you shouldn't do it? They go out and they conspire with the Herodians. Do you need a colorful demonstration? It would be as if the Democrats and Republicans got together and did something and anything just so that they could get back at somebody else. Pharisees and Herodians never really mix in the sacred scripture. 
except they have one thing in common. They both want to get rid of this rabble rouser, this guy Jesus who heals and breaks laws and makes us really feel embarrassed because he undermines everything we say and how we say it. Let's face it, sometimes in our congregations there are people that are hostile. And what's interesting is that at any given time, we're in each of those different three categories ourselves. Sometimes we're the people that are healing, but do we have the faith and trust that we can do it, that we can be an instrument of God? Sometimes we're the people that need to be healed. And oh boy, there's that laundry list of things, but do we believe that God will give it back to us? But sometimes we're the hostile ones. Because let's face it, when you hear the truth of the gospel message, sometimes it should make you very uncomfortable. It should shake you to your very core and make you ask yourself, am I really living out the fullness of the precepts of what Jesus is talking about in the scripture? I say it all the time after Mass. If you come outside and you tell me, Father, that was a wonderful homily this week, I'm going to take my homily and shred it and start all over again because it means it was terrible. A good homily is one that makes me look at myself and you look at you and ask the difficult questions, are are we cooperating with the Spirit? Or are we being hostile toward it? Are we painting over all the difficult parts of our life and making it look so nice and pretty that there's nothing wrong, uh, whitewashed tombs that are actually rotten on the inside? Or are we sometimes just so hostile to the gospel that when we speak the truth, we pervert it, twist it, and make it look a certain way so that we can get what we want and how we want it. Kind of like scribes and Pharisees, or Pharisees and Herodians do in the middle of the gospel. This is the logical gospel of gospels. If God wants to heal on the Sabbath, God could do it. And who are we to get in the middle of it, to be hostile toward it, or to prevent it from happening? As we prepare to celebrate the Eucharist, uh, when you come to Mass next time, put yourself into those three different sets of shoes. Be the one that gives healing. Be the one that's healed. But if you're the one that has hostility toward the truth and the message of the gospel, use it to shake you to your very core, to ask yourself some very difficult questions, so that not only you can seek conversion, you can seek healing, and then ultimately be a minister of that healing in the midst of brokenness. We stand to place before our God all of our prayers of petition and of need. For the times in which we fail to go out and bring the baptismal call to the world to preach and evangelize, may the Spirit fill our hearts so that we may constantly bring others to the faith. We pray to the Lord. For the times in which we fail to accept the healing of God, may God open our hearts to receive his Spirit and the healing that we need and encounter, we pray to the Lord. For the times in which we are hostile to the word of God, that God may soften our hearts so that we might understand the truth and necessity of our own conversion, we pray to the Lord. For our beloved dead who have gone before us marked with the sign of faith, and for those for whom this Mass is being offered, we pray to the Lord. And for the prayers, the petition, and need that we offer up in the silence of our hearts. Change our withered hearts, O God, so that we might be an instrument of your peace and salvation to all. Provide the needs that we place before your altar through Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Grant us, O Lord, we pray that we may participate worthily in these mysteries. For whenever the memorial of the sacrifice is celebrated, the work of our redemption is accomplished. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. <clears throat> His death we celebrate in love. His resurrection we confess with living faith. And His coming in glory we await with unwavering hope. And so with all the angels and the saints, we praise you, as without end we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts that we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim, by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, 
with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, Saint Ann, with, with Saint, Saint Margaret, Saint Thomas, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Michael, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, and merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom, and there we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory in Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow in the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. And at the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer to each other the sign of peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Pour on us, O Lord, the spirit of your love, and in your kindness, make those you have nourished by this one heavenly bread, one in mind and in heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. And as a reminder, on Wednesdays after Mass, we have Eucharistic adoration from after Mass until 8 p.m. Spend some time today in prayer with our Lord.